Well, as Angela said, welcome to UQ. And uh, as she said, I'm the head of School of Civil Engineering. And, uh, and basically, uh, I'm here more than to actually give a lecture. I'm here to try to understand fundamentally why are you here, OK? Uh, you might think that that is a very unusual question to ask. But if you think about it in a slightly uh, different way, uh, this is the beginning of your professional path. So this is the beginning of the path that you have chosen as being uh, the direction in which you're going to bring your entire career. And therefore, it is my assumption, or at least I hope that's a correct assumption, that you have put an enormous amount of thought in trying to understand you know, where, why are you in, at UQ. You know, why are you at UQ? Why are you in engineering? You know, why are you at all at a university? And uh, so I think that in many ways, I think that that is exactly where we should be starting. And, uh, and I want to put the question to you and uh, that sort of shadow uh, in front of that sort of bright fire, uh, well, if you can call that bright, uh, it is basically you. And I want to hear the answers. So why are you here? Happy to take answers, huh? That's very interesting, no? So money. Is that why you're here? Uh, as an in university education, you know, will enable you to earn money. OK? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable, and I can very happily accept the argument that getting professional studies is fundamentally a mechanism to guarantee yourself a living. You know, being able to pay for the bills and all these things that fundamentally we deem as being so uh, important in our lives. But when you think about money as the ultimate goal, that is the ultimate goal, maybe, if you want to put it that way. I could say professional satisfaction. You know, I could say a career that is going to bring me into a lot of exciting places. I could give all sorts of other reasons that represent the outcome in itself. But that is the outcome. That is the end product, the end effect, not the reason why you're here. The reason why you're here is much more complicated than that, because fundamentally it has to involve a certain set of thoughts that basically created a, a thought process. And that thought process brought you from being in a high school or being wherever you were before you came here to think, well, there is UQ as an institution, there's engineering as a discipline, and there is Project C, which is what the one that you chose when you came here. So money doesn't answer my question. That's not the reason why you're sitting in this room. Money is just simply the ultimate goal, as many other potential goals that you can have. But this is not why you are here. Okay? The question is, why are you here? Why are you sitting here? Why are you sitting here? And why are you sitting here? Okay? And I need an answer. I want to know why you are sitting in this room. That's an ultimate outcome. That's not the reason why you're sitting here. You're going back to the same thing as money. Money is an ultimate goal, but it's not the reason why you're sitting here. Why did you make the choice to come here? Yes. OK, so you narrow it down a little bit. You wanted to learn engineering. OK, now I'm going to throw the question back at you. Why? Because it makes you money? <laughs> OK, so basically what you're saying is that you're interested in engineering because engineering enables you to learn how to solve problems many times right in the spot. Give answers to questions, give answers to problems. And you find that exciting and interest. And that's what motivates you to choose engineering. Is that OK? OK, I'm very happy and willing to accept your answer. OK, because that is truly an answer that reflects a thought process that effectively brought him into engineering. But that doesn't answer my question. I'm talking about here. Hold on, he's talking. Yes. OK, so basically he's saying that he's here because he wants to have a laugh or he has to have fun. Well, why don't you go to Griffiths or QUT, or why don't you go to University of Sydney, University of Melbourne, or Western Australia? You can have a laugh there. I mean, there's clowns like me everywhere.
Nobody else wants to volunteer an answer? Yes. Yeah, and, and I can understand that. Basically, you find this as a path to try to structure your knowledge in a way such that you can do something with it in an effective way. Your answer is very similar to the other answer in the sense that you fundamentally see engineering as being that. Okay? And as I say, I'm comfortable with that. But why UQ? I mean, we're moving to this place. So why UQ? Why are you here? What makes us different that effectively made you choose in the little box to say, I'm going to go to UQ? Yes, but you have to scream because I cannot walk that far. OK, so basically, you are looking for a context with your friends, and the university has a good reputation. A good reputation for what? OK, what does it mean, academic excellence? I mean, keep in mind, what we're talking about is the first steps of your professional future. And you're not giving me any convincing answers you know, of why you're here. Because I know a lot of other universities that have a great reputation for academic excellence, but that doesn't, and a lot of them are very close by. So that doesn't really answer my question. Do you really know why you're here? You know, do you truly have a clue why you made a decision to come to this university? And don't tell me that because your parents told you, because that's probably the case for 90% of the people in the room, no? I mean, seriously, do you really know exactly why you're here? And then you chose Project C. And you say, well, I'm going to want to do Project C. Why? Oh, it sounded exciting. It was the least boring of all the projects. I had no other choice because all the other ones were full. So think about it, OK? You know, you've come from high school. You know, you've been nurtured you know, through the, the entire early, early years of your career. And at this point, you're reaching that level in which the decision is yours, OK? Are you going to walk in? into a decision in a completely uninformed way? It's a little bit scary, no? It's a slippery slope, because you're going to go into a certain professional path that effectively defines your entire working life, that could actually define you know, where you live. You know, I was born in Peru. Okay? If I would have chosen to go to law or to architecture, I would have stayed in Peru for the rest of my life. I chose engineering. And engineering opened the doors for me to go anywhere I wanted, because the engineer there is the same engineer here, or the same engineer in the US. So I could go anywhere I wanted. So your professional decisions fundamentally define your life in many, 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 many different ways. Okay? And you're telling me that you're just simply walking into it without really giving it a very, very thorough thought? I mean, the silence of the room is a little bit scary, no? When you're standing on my side and you're seeing a whole bunch of people that fundamentally represent the next generation of professionals, and I'm asking you, why are you here? And you all tell me because of money. It kind of worries me, no? This is why we have this class. This is what ENG 1100 is all about. It's giving you the experience to try to understand the reasoning behind why you are here. Okay? It is that possibility that you have to look you know, through the little hole and try to see what engineering is all about, you know, what civil engineering is about, what mechanical engineering is all about, what chemical engineering is all about, so that by the end of this process, you can rethink your thought process and try to understand why are you here. Okay? In a similar manner, this is a kind of class that exposes you to the essence of what this university is all about. Okay, this is not any university. Okay? It might not be better or worse than any other university. Yes, it does have a very good reputation, and that's a very, very good thing. Your degrees are going to be worth a lot 
Why? Because they're UQ degrees. Okay? But that's not the reason why you're here. So this class, once again, gives you a little bit of a glimpse of the reasoning behind this institution, why this institution is unique, and what inst this institution can actually provide you. Okay? That is different to what Sydney can provide, or Melbourne, or QUT, or Griffiths, or Western Australia. All these universities will provide something different. Okay? We have something to give you. Uh, that something to give you is something that you need to embrace. And if you actually embrace that the right way, you will get the most out of us and basically direct you into the right path. In a similar manner, if that is not for you, then that is not for you. So that's why we have this particular class, because we recognize that in the process of entering the university, fundamentally, you know, we do not have the tools to be able to truly understand the reasoning behind your decision. So that hesitation, you know, the sort of laughable comments that everybody makes are just simply mechanisms to try to avoid admitting the fact that you truly do not know where you're here. Okay? So the rest of the hour today, I'll give you a glimpse in relation to Project C of why you are here. And my hope is that through the rest of the, of the semester, as you go through NG1100, you will actually identify some of the things that I have said today and see how the different components of NG1100 are delivering these little glimpses that enable you to understand why are you here. So if at the end of the term you can actually answer that question and answer it properly and be convinced that your decision was the correct one, or be convinced that the decision is the wrong one and therefore I should be doing something else, we would have done our job right. Okay? So, let me give you that glimpse in, in a few minutes so you get a little bit of a sense of what I'm talking about. So, this is where you live. Okay? So, that's Brisbane. Okay? Cities like Brisbane are fundamentally an engineering masterpiece. Okay? This is what the environment in which we live this is what we're comfortable. You know, this is what we can get from point A to B. This is why we can open the faucet and water comes out. This is why we can turn on the lights and energy pours in into your home. So basically, this is a fundamental engineering masterpiece. Okay? Now, it's incredibly complex. It has all sorts of different layers. It is really fundamentally a network of knowledge and technology that fundamentally enables your existence. Without the city, then everything gets transformed into something that is completely different. Okay? Imagine yourself living without electricity. You know, all of you that are basically checking your emails on your mobile phones will be completely frustrated because you wouldn't have access to your emails. Imagine a city without water. Imagine a city without public transportation. You will have to walk from point A to B. All these things are essential elements of infrastructure that enables our life as we know it. Okay? Nevertheless, while we take them for granted, they are not simple things. They are extremely complicated, and they require an enormous amount of knowledge, intelligence, and engineering. So if I just ask you, give me a list. Start throwing things at me. Okay? What are the kinds of things that you think you have in a city that require engineering. Bridges. Brisbane has amazing bridges, a number of them, some very unique bridges like the Kulripa Bridge, you know, which is this tensor grid structure, which is a very, very unique structure. So all these bridges are part of the infrastructure that fundamentally are based on engineering knowledge. What else? Cars. Okay. So cars, effectively, they're engineering structures that enable you to basically move from point A to B in a much faster manner than it would be if you actually had to walk. Those cars are an enormous uh, amount, they have an enormous amount of technology embedded in them, and they're fundamentally part of the city. What else? Yeah, so basically everything that has to do with sanitation, water, waste management, all these things, you know, you've all done this. You know, every other day or every other week, you have to get your garbage can outside and you have to get your uh, recyclables one day and you have to get your organics another, another day. And you put them outside 
and the miracle happens every Sunday night. You know, you wake up Monday morning, and there's no garbage. What happened with the garbage? There's a huge network of waste management. Okay? Think about it. You know, there's a famous paper by a professor called Paolo Tombesi, you know, about the importance of the design of the toilet in architecture. You take them for granted, no? But what happens every time you go to the toilet? Flush. Gone. Can you imagine living in a society where you cannot do that? Do you know that about 80% of the world lives in a society where they cannot flush? Think about it. Think what it means to be able to actually, whenever you need it, flush. It's gone. I didn't have to smell it. I didn't have to see it. It just disappeared. Miraculously, where did it go? Some engineer defined a, an enormous sanitation network that go from the collection all the way to the disposal and treatment and many times to the production of energy out of it. There you go, infrastructure. What else? Yep. Yep, so you have all the power distribution. So fundamentally, cities have to basically bring power from the outside so that actually they can feed the city. And that represents an enormous amount of effort. It represents the design of the towers. That is a structural engineering problem that is very complex, all the way to the cables and all the ele elect ele electricity associated things. You know, the networking is a mathematical problem of the highest complexity because you have to basically manage to balance the network in such a way that depending on, independent of the fluctuations, that you have on power demand, you always can distribute enough energy to where it's need needed. In such a way that when you wake up in the morning and you turn the lights on, the lights go on. Okay? And it might be that sometimes the power goes up, the power goes down, and the, net the network needs to re-equilibrate itself to actually deliver what you need. There you have an enormous feat of engineering. What else? Sorry? Factories. So basically, we have an industrial network that supports the city, and that industrial network in itself is an engineering feat, but also the distribution networks, because you're producing things that you have to deliver to different places, and you actually have to do it in an appropriate way. So as you can see, we can go forever, and you will find that there's layers and layers and layers of engineering that goes behind. Okay? So in a way, this is what a city is. This is the infrastructure that we're putting in place. So basically, this is the place where you live, and these are the kinds of things that you need to deal with. So you're going to have transportation networks, you're going to have trains, you're going to have buses, you know, you're going to have airports, so you have the Brisbane Airport, you're going to have the CityCAD that basically supplies uh, an, a very nice and appropriate add-on to the transportation network. You know, you have highways, you have, you name it, I can list endless things that basically are part of our transportation network. So transport becomes a fundamental aspect of what a city is all about. Now, think about it. We were talking with the Port of Brisbane not that long ago. What is the impact of the Port of Brisbane in you being able to get from here to home? Have you ever thought about it? We live very, very, very far away from the Port of Brisbane. How does the Port of Brisbane affect my everyday commute? Any suggestions? Yes. Can you talk a little bit lower? OK, so that effectively is something that the Port of Brisbane brings to me. So it brings merchandises and things that come from other places. So if you want to eat a banana in the morning, you better have the Port of Brisbane because otherwise it will never get to you. Okay? That I understand. But how does it affect, when we're talking about transport, how does it affect your everyday commute? Yes. Okay, but you mentioned, for example, trucks. How do those trucks get to the Port of Brisbane? They have to use my roads. So they ruin my commute because they create congestion. I mean, we've all sat 
behind a truck complaining that we cannot see, that the truck is too big, that they're going too slow. Fundamentally, when you analyze the design and implementation of a port, when you think of the expansion of a port, when you think that the port has actually to service, for example, the coal industry and all these things, you have to start thinking on the impact that all that traffic that is generated by the port is going to have on the entire transportation network of a city. So fundamentally, if I decide to expand the port, most likely I need to completely revamp all the highways around Brisbane. Because I'm going to be bringing a whole load you know, of trucks that effectively are going to affect the way I drive every day from home to here. Now, needless to say, I could substitute them by trains. In which case then I have to invest in trains. There was a project of a 17-kilometer tunnel to actually put a train system under Brisbane to be able to transport coal from Toowoomba all the way to the port because they realized that if they did that by truck, it would have been a lot cheaper, but it would have completely collapsed all the highway network in, in that sector from Toowoomba to Brisbane. So that's transport. It's not an easy problem. It's a mathematical problem. It's a complicated infrastructure problem. It's a complicated technology problem. Okay? From the decision of how much they're going to charge you for your go-kart, you know, all the way to the decision of expanding on a port, on an airport, the ramifications in your transport network are absolutely enormous. So, as you can see, every one of these problems is an incredible engineering problem. And these are the kinds of things that you face when you decide to study engineering. Okay? Now, when you talk about buildings and infrastructure, we tend to know, for example, civil engineering more than anything for the kind of infrastructure that we built. Every civil engineer dreams of building the best bridge in the world. Okay, so you have the Kulripa Bridge in here, and, uh, and, or the, the structure in there, the, uh, the Eagle Street building. All these structures are unique structures, iconic structures that every civil engineer dreams to build. You know, you have massive tunnels, you have all this infrastructure, all these things that are part. You know, from the Suncor Stadium, you know, all the way to just simply building a three-story housing. All those problems are engineering problems, okay? Now, are they interconnected? Of course they're interconnected. They're part of a transport network. They're part of an educational network. So the infrastructure in which you are sitting, the university in itself, its location, its positioning, you know, the buildings that we build, they're all part of the things that we have to introduce in the city to make it work. You know, what is a city without schools? It's not a city. So we need to create infrastructure to develop those schools. And all that infrastructure is part of what we do as engineers. And in many cases, it's incredibly exciting because you got to build the first tensor grid bridge that was ever built in the world. That's the Kuripa Bridge. Okay? You know, the fig tree structure of the, of the Eagle Street building you know, is fundamentally a unique structure that required huge uh, proficiency in engineering. But other structures are also important. And they fulfill a role and they are part of what our city is all about. We talked about water and sanitation, and it goes from the design of the toilet to the management of the pollution of Morton Bay. Okay? We made a decision as a society that we were going to stop ignoring how we were destroying the environment. We created the word sustainability. Do you know what sustainability means? Does anybody have a suggestion of what sustainability means? What does it mean to live in a sustainable society? It doesn't look after itself, but the outcome is the same. So what happens when a society looks after, after itself? It continues in a sustainable way. It's not crumbling to pieces, deteriorating, complicating itself, messing itself up. It is fundamentally a society that continues to improve as it progresses instead of deteriorating as it progresses. That's sustainability. Okay? It's that capacity that we have to look proactive at the future and say, I'm not going to make this decision because in the long term, this is going to represent a deterioration of my environment, you know, my social structures, and all these things. Okay? So when it comes to water and sanitation, 
the word sustainability is fundamental because we are a society that produces an enormous amount of waste. And that waste has to go somewhere. Okay? And in many, many, many cases, ends up in our water streams. Okay? And once it ends up in our water streams, it ends up in places where we actually, truly didn't want it. Okay? So you have to be extremely careful you know, to be sure that when you design the things and you build them in an adequate way, that fundamentally you take into consideration the entire environment. So it's not about just the river. It is about the river. Is it about the bay? Is it about outside the bay? You know, it is about the way in which we transport, for example, uh, chemical products that could be bad for you. Lots of people talk about brominated compounds. Brominated compounds are, are one of the things that make our society viable. Why? Because you can use plastics. The moment you put a plastic, a plastic is a flammable material that could actually burn and create a fire that could mess up everything. Okay? So the way we enable plastics to enter the market was by putting what we call fire retardants. And fire retardants are chemicals that prevent the materials from burning. And therefore, you can allow yourself to use plastics for the carpets, plastics for the chairs, plastics for the wall linings, and all these other plastics. But nevertheless, these fire retardants contain halogen products that are of the kind of bromine, chlorine, and fluoride, which are all very bad for the environment. They're very bad for people. Okay? Now, these products, when you have them in, in your buildings, okay, fundamentally they leach. In other words, they come out. Okay? Your body absorbs them. And then, when you go to the toilet, you release them. Okay? And what happens when you release them? If you don't control them, where do they go? Sorry? Yeah, they return. How do they return? They go to the river. And then what happens in the river? Who eats them? Yeah. So basically they go from you to the water, from the water to the fish, from the fish back to your mouth. Okay? Which creates a closed circle, which starts increasing and increasing and increasing the content of brominated products in your blood. Okay? The impact of that, pretty bad. Those are the things that you need to consider when you're thinking of your city as it is. How you are actually going to manage these things in a way such that fundamentally you prevent these negative things to happen. That's part of engineering. Okay? Considering all these things into place and providing solutions is part of what engineering is all about. So, the other thing that we need to consider is what happens when it all goes wrong. Here you have your beautiful city we have controlled the water, the sanitation, the structures, the bridges, the transport, everything. We have everything under control. You wake up in the morning, and today is just like yesterday. And tomorrow will be just like today. You turn on the light, light comes out, you flush the toilet, water goes through. Everything works out beautifully. You get out of the house, very well fed, nice breakfast. You know, all the food that came through the port of Brisbane. And then all of a sudden, you jump in the car, the perfect transportation network, you get to the university, beautiful infrastructure. You know, yeah, you, of course, you have a clown that comes and tells you a lot of things in the class, but that's a different story. And then, you know, finally your day is perfect. You go back home, you fall asleep watching TV, because basically that's what we do. What happens if all goes wrong? You know, Earth, you can have terrorist acts, fires, earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, bushfires, typhoons, hurricanes. What do we do then? Is that an engineering problem? Yeah. And that engineering problem has several steps. What is the first step of that engineering problem? Huh? Well, you have to design in a robust manner so you are protected against all the things, no? So in your thoughts of the development of the city, the things that are possible need to be taken into account. So if you live in New Zealand or in Japan, you will design for seismic activity. If you live in Brisbane, maybe not, okay? But if you live in north of Queensland, you will 
you would design for a number of other things like typhoons, while in Brisbane you will design for floods. So you create robust infrastructure. Okay? Yes, somebody wants to say something else. Okay, so basically that is your element of response. So you have to be able to engineer the response in an adequate way. So what happens if all our infrastructure is collapsed? We have to create temporary means of providing transportation, of providing sanitation, of providing housing, of doing all these things. That, does, does that ring a bell with Project C? Okay, that's what you're trying to do. You have to be able to respond. You have to be able to design in a robust way, but you have to be able to respond in an adequate way. So cities themselves have to have, depending on the possible natural disasters that they have, they have to have an emergency plan, a contingency plan, something that enables me to respond in an adequate way. That is an engineering problem. Okay? So as you can see, it goes full cycle. From the generation of a city, you know, all the way to its management and all the way to its recovery if the city actually has to suffer any kind of impact. As you can see, engineers in many ways play an enormous role in the development of society as we know it, from its inception to the response after a tragedy. Okay? We play an enormous role in trying to make things happen in the right way. Now, all that being said, that's what engineering is all about. Okay? When it comes to society, when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to city, engineers play an enormous role in the development, gestation, and recovery of all this infrastructure. Okay? So that's engineering. That gives you a sense where Project C sits in engineering. It sits in that recovery part that, yes, it incorporates everything. It incorporates transport, it incorporates sanitation, it incorporates all these other things because at the end we need to provide a response. And that response needs to incorporate every single element of the process. You know, from temporary structures like the buildings that you see in the, in the right-hand corner, this, those are in Christchurch in New Zealand. And basically after the major earthquake in New Zealand, a lot of temporary structures were developed. So the one in the right is a shopping center and the one in the top left is a church. So we have to go from guaranteeing that people that want to go to church can actually go to church as fast as possible, all the way to provide the capacity for people to go and shop. Okay? You have portable sanitation units, portable uh, bridges, you know, tents, all these different things that fundamentally create shelter, create sanitation, create transport, and create all the things that are absolutely necessary. Okay? So that's what Project C is all about. And basically, we're taking one big piece of the puzzle, which is the response puzzle, and charging you with understanding how to provide a solution to a specific problem that is linked to response, but is part of the general problem of how we develop infrastructure. Okay? This is how we develop cities, this is how we do things so that we can guarantee our lifestyle, but let's take one little piece so we can actually give you a glimpse of all the things that you need to understand and know and handle to be able to respond in an adequate way. So it gives you a little bit of a glimpse to that engineering that is associated to infrastructure that fundamentally will help you understand why are you here. Okay? There's one aspect of the problem, and that concerns more you than it concerns me. Okay? And that's change. Okay? When my parents and my grandparents grew up, things didn't change at all. Life, when it came to infrastructure, was a very, very stagnant, comfortable, and pleasant thing. Okay? Even myself, you know, when I entered university, you know, I was taught how to solve an equation because that was the equation that fundamentally will give me the answer to the engineering problem. Okay? I, was told, I was told how to use a technology, because that technology had been used in the 1940s, in the 1950s, in the 1970s, and most certainly will be used in the 1980s and the 1990s. Okay? Infrastructure didn't change. Now, the reasoning is very clear. It's, we're not the same as electronics. You know, when you're talking about development of a mobile phone, 
What happens if the mobile phone doesn't start? You buy a new one. What happens if a building collapses? You kill everybody. Okay? So fundamentally, the responsibility is so large that we cannot change that fast because we cannot reboot the computer. Okay? If we have an engineering failure in infrastructure, we are in trouble and we are affecting an enormous amount of people in a very critical way. If your sanitation network stops working and instead of getting clean water, you get sewage in your shower, are you going to be happy? Not really, no. This will be a very stinky room. No? So fundamentally, you know, we deal with a magnitude of a problem that fundamentally requires that we move very slowly in the process. So that's the way I grew up. That's the way I was educated. The tools of today were going to be the tools of tomorrow and the tools of 10 years from now. The materials that we were using were concrete, steel, and timber, and that was it. We were not changing anything. Everything moved at a pace that was very, very, very slow. Now, think of change now. So this is change. If you look at the 1940s, if you look at the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, the cities evolved, and they evolved at a very reasonable pace. Today, the change is extremely dramatic. It changes at a very, 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 very fast pace. So what does this mean for you? So what do you think, given the context? you have to become a lot more adaptable, no? So basically, you have to start thinking in a completely different way. Because if I come to classroom and I teach you an equation and I say, this is the way it works, okay? What is going to happen 10 years from now? It won't work. So you will have a different equation, a different problem, a different context, something that is completely different, and you cannot rely on the education to actually be able to guarantee your profession, okay? We educate people fundamentally to be professionals for 30 to 40 years. And in this particular case, that challenge is enormous. Now, think about it again. This is the nature of modern life. Okay? Fast-paced, dramatic change, constant evolution. And the real question goes back to you. What does this mean for you? Okay? You have to become adaptable. How do you become adaptable? Everything is too fast, too challenging, too multidisciplinary, too complex, too unpredictable. How do you deal with that? We are supposed to educate you so that you can actually be able to do that. What does that mean for you? What relation does it have to UQ? Why that makes this place the right place to do that? It's the people in this place. What you have in a place like UQ is a group of individuals that are at the cutting edge of everything that they're doing. Okay? And basically they think in a different way. Because the way they think is not about solving problems with the tools of today, but it's about molding the future. We are creating professionals not to service the industry of today, but we're creating professionals that will transform the industry in the future. That's what we do. That's what makes us different. We're not solving the problems of today. We are fundamentally working to try to create a new way of thinking that brings us to the future, that basically creates individuals like you, that by the time you walk outside of this room, you're not there to be good for industry. You're there to change industry, to transform it, and to make it viable. Because the pace is too fast, the problem is too complicated, everything is too uncertain, and if you cannot adapt and you cannot continue to evolve, then you cannot get there. So how do we make you adaptable? How do we make you adaptable? What do we have to teach you to make you adaptable? Well, that's the means. We expose you to all this way of thinking. That's the means. But what do we have to do with you to make sure that you can continue to adapt in this fast-paced, evolving, technological, complex society? What do we have to do? Are you bringing 
Why? They're old-fashioned. The real-life situation is yesterday. The industry that you see, that's yesterday. Five years from now, these guys, either they adapt or they're gone. So we have to create a different type of individual, a person that actually knows how to evolve. You had something to say. So your brains have to be molded to do what? And how you have to be capable of doing what? Think about it. Thinking and new things are coming constantly. Okay? So what do you have to do constantly? Yes. Okay. Uncomfortable situation, new situations. What was the word in the middle? Uh, no. She used a word, very specific one. Learn. Okay? What is the difference between a UQ education and any, well, not any, but basically a UQ education or what we aspire to be? We're here to make sure that you are adaptable, that you can be thinkers, that you can deal with new situations. But how do we do that? We educate you to be able to learn how to learn. Okay? That's what you get from us. That is the reason why you're here, okay? The reason why you're here is because you're here to learn how to learn. And this kind of environment is a unique place where you fundamentally come here not to be taught, not to learn the equation, not to learn about the new material or to learn about what industry does. You will get exposed to all those things for the good, for the bad, and for the ugly, okay? But fundamentally, you're here for one single reason. And that's the reason why you're here. Because we can provide you an environment that enables you to learn how to learn. Thank you.